Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight are two of the students who work in the Planetarium. Familiar faces if you've been here before, but I will still let them introduce themselves. And we will start with this guy here to my left. Hi, I'm Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy undergraduate student at UMB. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMB. So tonight, since it is beginning of June, I can't believe it, um, we are going to walk you through the celestial events that are happening this month, which I know isn't too terribly much, but there's still some cool things to look at. Um, before I hand it over to Eli, who's going to be uh, walking us through these events for the month, um, as always, if you have any questions throughout, feel free to leave them down in the comments. I'll keep an eye on those, uh, and we will answer them as they come up, or uh, we'll take time at the end to answer questions as well. Um, I forgot to turn on screen sharing because I do this every time. This is now just a regular part of our stream. All right, um, Eli, it is all yours. All right, another regular part of our stream. I'm going to make sure that everything looks right. Um, does that look good? Yep. Okay, sweet. All right, welcome to What's up, June, everybody? Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the moon, because um, that's kind of one of the only things we can rely on to happen every month. Um, so the phases of the moon this month um, were kind of offset by this diagram just because the third quarter moon is happening, well, tonight. Um, so third quarter moon is tonight. It's going to rise at 2.18 a.m. Um, or, well, that was 2.18 this morning, rather. Um, and it set at 1.02 in the afternoon. So if you were up really late last night, um, well, or into early this morning, I suppose, you uh, caught the third quarter moon. Um, but don't worry, um, if you catch it again tonight, um, you'll see pretty close to a third quarter moon if you missed it. Um, the new moon, which is the phase at which um, you can't see it, or you know, it's it's in between the Earth and the Sun, is on June 10th, and we have a little more to talk with or talk about with that later. But we'll save that for a couple more a uh, couple minutes from now. Um, the first quarter moon is going to be on June 17th. Um, it's going to rise at 1:24 in the morning and set at 12:24 in the afternoon. Um, so you have to be up uh, real early if you want to catch that one at a, at a good time. Um, and then the full moon is happening on uh, June 24th. It's going to rise at 4.48 in the morning, set at 9.35 at night. Um, and that um, every month has uh, their, their full moons have a different name. Um, June's is called the strawberry moon. Um, but it is also going to be a uh, super moon this month, which we also had last month, I'm pretty sure, which is it's, uh, pretty fun. Yep, the past um, two months have been a super moon, with last month's being the biggest of the super moons. Right, but this is the last one. So July's uh, full moon will not be a super moon. Um, and uh, just to give some context for what a super moon is, sometimes the moon is further and closer to the Earth, and when it and it's by a very small well, very small is not the right word, but small in astronomical terms amount. Um, and when it is that little bit closer, um, it uh, appears a little bit bigger in the sky. So uh, like I said, on the left here, you can see what a normal moon looks like. Um, and then on the right, you can see what a super moon looks like. Um, again, not that much bigger, but it is like, there is kind of this like uncanny thing. Like you look at a super moon and you're like, wow, that is like way bigger than it usually is. And it shines a lot brighter. Maybe that's just like placebo because you know that it's a super moon. Um, but at least, I mean, I think when you look at a supermoon, like you can definitely notice that it's more than the moon normally is. So uh, I, I have a hypothesis on this. Okay, let's hear it. Um, I think it's because during supermoons, people go out and look right around when the moon is rising. And, oh, and then be it's because the horizon is there. Right, because of um, that optical illusion that you have like buildings and trees to compare it to, it feels yeah. like it's bigger than when it's higher in the sky. Yeah. So like that's my that's, hypothesis. That's a good point actually cuz the the this is just kind of anecdotal but the the one supermoon that like really sticks out in my memory um it was really close to the horizon and I remember looking and be like holy smokes that thing looks huge. But I feel like other than that like I haven't really like really put two and two together that it could be a supermoon when it looked bright. So yeah, maybe that is that maybe that is the case. Um 
uh, just a little more context again for the supermoon. We also have micromoons, um, which is what happens when it's kind of the opposite, when it's a little bit further than it usually is from Earth. Um, but yeah, there's your uh, your context. And again, it, I mean, it doesn't double in size or anything like that, but it is it does get appreciably bigger, especially when you're looking at a diagram like this, or it's close to trees and buildings on the horizon. Um, so again, going back to uh, the new moon that I was talking about, um, we have a partial solar eclipse this month, um, which is really exciting. And I'm going to start off, well, actually, so actually, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, I want to start off, please do not look at the eclipse without proper eye protection, please. Um, even if it's a partial eclipse, I mean, total solar eclipses, you can't look at the eclipse um, without eye protection, without damaging your eyes. Like this, uh, this young lady on the right here is woefully unprepared for the uh, the eclipse and might damage her eyes if she decides to look at the sun. Um, just because the moon is blocking some of the light does not mean that the light will not hurt you. Um, and uh, you do need to get proper eye protection. You can find them on Amazon. There are a couple websites online you can find them at. Um, but please, please wear proper protection um, when you're uh, looking at the, uh, at the uh, eclipse. Um, a lot of very smart people in the past have failed to do this and ruined their eyesight, for example. Um, I don't think it was during an eclipse, but the uh, the sentiment stands, Isaac Newton looked at the sun um, and blinded himself for a couple of days. So the inventor of modern math um, and physics blinded himself by looking at the sun. Don't, oh, I shouldn't say don't be like him because if you want to revolutionize science like he did, you should do that, but um, don't blind yourself. Um, and to, so, uh, to further clarify, regular sunglasses are not proper protection no, for this. No, you need to not. get what are called solar glasses or solar eclipse glasses, because those yep. block like over 99% of the light coming in, and that's what makes it safe. Yep, and uh, I, I will admit I've made this mistake before. Stacking multiple pairs of regular sunglasses on top of each other is not proper eye protection. I'm a bad example. Um, I attempted that with the, uh, when was that? The 2017 yeah. solar eclipse? Is that the one? Yeah. yeah. Still hurt. So take, take this advice. It hurt my eyes. I had, I had, I think six pairs stacked on top of each other. So I looked funny and I was doing the wrong thing. Um, but, uh, let's talk about a little bit, um, uh, about what a, uh, partial solar eclipse is. So during the new moon phase of um, every lunar cycle, the moon is in between the sun and the earth, but it's not always directly in between such that it blocks light coming from the sun. Um, but sometimes it lines up and actually does that. And that's when we get what is called an eclipse. Um, so the partial solar eclipse is the part of the eclipse that we are going to see here in Duluth. If you lived, um, I believe it would be it's up north, like north, more in the northern hemisphere, or we're in the northern hemisphere, but more north, um, so like upper Russia and like Canada. I believe that's where you would catch the uh, the full eclipse, and it's not even technically a full eclipse, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but uh, since we're not in that path of totality, it's called, um, we're just going to get the partial solar, solar eclipse. So rather than you know the sun being blocked out or getting a ring of fire, which is what it's going to be this time. Um, it's going to be like a crescent. So the moon, the moon will just pass and block some of the sun's light. Still really amazing to see. It's going to be really cool. Again, please wear proper eyewear. Um, but uh, if you happen to be in, you know, northern Canada or Russia at this time, what you will see is called an annular eclipse. Um, and this is really cool because um, at some positions, um, like with the sun, when the sun's further away or closer, or when the moon's further away or closer, the moon isn't quite the right size to completely block the sun as it goes in front of it. Um, in this instance, it's because the sun is also kind of closer to us right now, um, as well as the moon, um, but the sun being closer overweighs the moon being closer. So the moon won't actually block out all of the sun. You'll get this, what's called a ring of fire or an annulus, which is why it's called an annular solar eclipse um, in the sky. And it looks super cool. It, it reminds me of like, I don't know, like cool movie art or like video game graphics or something like that, but it's going to look really cool. So, I mean, if you're dedicated and you've got some, uh, some vacation days to take, make a trip, um, go find where that path of totality is and watch this annular solar eclipse. Um, they are really cool. I mean, I've never seen one. I don't know if Jessica or Lindsay have ever seen one. I don't know when the last one around here was, um, but uh, I really want to see them. They look really cool. But if you can't make that trip, a, uh, a partial solar eclipse like this one is also pretty sweet. 
Um, and just one also like temporary solution or, you know, solution to not looking at the sun directly. Um, if you don't get your hands on a pair of eclipse glasses, you could also make what's called a pinhole projector. And I know Jessica has done a lot of these and some variations of them. So maybe you want to talk about them a little more. But basically the idea is that you take two pieces of paper and one of them is kind of like your screen or like what the light gets projected on. And then one of them is a filter. And so it you concentrate some of the light coming from the eclipse and it projects it onto your like piece of paper that's like a screen. Maybe Jessica, if you want to talk about it a little more, probably explain it better than I can. But it's a, a really good solution to be able to watch an eclipse without damaging your eyes or looking at the sun. Yeah, and doesn't require any special equipment at all. Right. Um, yeah, so I think you explained it pretty well. Um, I do recommend having something a little bit more rigid for where you're going to poke your hole in. And you want to make that hole as small as possible. And that's going to ensure that the light coming through is going to show you the disk of the sun rather than just the spray of light coming from all over the sky. The idea is with that little tiny hole, you're getting the direct rays coming directly from the sun, and that's why you see the projected image and see the actual disk of the sun projected there. Um, for anyone that was one of our uh, virtual campers last summer, uh, we actually made a pinhole projector that you can uh, use for this. So if there are any of our campers watching and you still have that pinhole projector, you have something yeah. great that you can use to watch the eclipse. Yeah, so uh, that's just another good solution. If you can't get your hands on eclipse glasses or solar glasses, um, that's another good way to go about it and protect your eyes. Um, this will so, also uh, naturally happen when, if you have the trees with like the leaves that are really, really close together, as the light comes through those tiny little gaps in the leaves, it'll make a bunch of little mini pinhole projectors, and you'll see that on the ground. It's really, it's wicked cool to see. Oh, that sounds really cool. Now that it, now that you mentioned, I think um, Bob King showed us something about that the last show he did. He did, uh, yeah. If anyone's interested yeah. in that, in our Astronomy Day live stream, um, Bob did a show about the the lunar eclipse that happened. Uh, last week and then the solar eclipse that's coming up so you can always go check that out as well yeah so um already moving on um we want to talk about what the planets are going to be doing in the night sky this month um so first of all um jupiter and saturn are going to be visible in like the east southeastern sky um for the majority of the month in the very early hours of the morning so as you can see that little date and time window i have down on the bottom right we're looking at like two, three in the morning, they're going to be the best to view. They'll be visible a little earlier, but you know, you kind of want to see them when they're as far from the horizon as they, they will get through that night. And that's usually around two or three in the morning um, before the sun starts to come up and, you know, dim or illuminate the sky around them, make them harder to see. So if you want to catch Jupiter and Saturn kind of close to one another in the sky, early hours of the morning in the southeastern sky. Um, Another cool thing that's happening is um, Jupiter is going to be doing a little bit of retrograde motion um, starting this month, and not a little bit, it's actually going to last a couple months. Um, but Jupiter is going to be uh, starting its retrograde motion um, this month, and that is going to begin on the 20th. Um, again, it's going to be kind of hard to see like as you're just watching the sky, but you'll be able to notice it from day to day. So maybe if you have a star chart or you want to mark down where you're seeing them like relative to each other, if you follow it from June to I believe October is when the retrograde motion ends, um, you'll notice that Jupiter actually starts moving the opposite direction that it was before. Um, and to explain that, um, we have a little graphic here. Um, so basically what retrograde motion is, is um, when an outer planet um, is like Earth and an outer planet are passing by each other in their orbits, like you can see here. Since the Earth's orbit is smaller, it's going to like bypass that outer planet and it'll kind of make a lap around it almost. And when that happens, it appears that the outer planet actually starts moving the other direction for a minute. It doesn't actually, the planet is still going the same direction it was, but just because Earth passed it, it's going to look like its direction changes temporarily. Um, and all of the outer planets do this. Um, but uh, usually we hear we hear it most with um, Mars, um, like Mars is retrograde is really talked about, I think just because Mars is maybe easier to see or even though it's not really. Um, but uh, all the outer planets do it and Jupiter's begins this month. Um, so again, you won't be able to see it if you just sit there and watch, but um, it will appear to be moving the other direction from day to day for the next couple months. Um, 
after which in October, it'll start moving the direction it was going before again. Um, in addition to a very close together Jupiter and Saturn, there will be a conjunction of Saturn and the moon uh, in the early morning of June 27th. So you can see here, we've got like 3 a.m., 3.30 a.m. even. Um, Saturn and the moon are gonna be very close to each other in the constellation of Capricornus. Um, the moon's gonna be, I believe the number was four degrees below um, Saturn. And as a little rule of thumb, when you uh, put your, I mean, I should maybe do this on video. Maybe I'll do that at the end to show um, the degrees. Um, but uh, the other thing is that since Jupiter and Saturn are really close to one another and there's a conjunction of Saturn and the moon on June 27th, that means that there has to follow a conjunction of Jupiter and the moon, which happens the next day. Literally the next day in the morning, um, the moon is gonna be four degrees away from Jupiter. So uh, we've got two conjunctions um, night after night. Um, between Jupiter and Saturn and the moon, which is really cool. So like, um, like I said, um, the morning of June 28th, you'll be able to see a little, bit, like pretty close together triangle made of Jupiter, Saturn, and the moon um, in the constellations of Capricorn, Aquarius, that area. Um, okay, so this image is kind of hard to read, but the program that I took these images from didn't make it very easy to get it. Um, so Venus and Mercury will be hanging out um, pretty close to the horizon in the late hours of the night for the first portion of the month, after which they'll kind of dip below the horizon. Um, and, you know, depending on where the sun is, it'll be harder to see them. Um, but so this green line, can you guys see my cursor on the, um, okay, you can't see my notes window though, right? That's not blocked or anything. Okay, good, good. Um, so um, as you can see here, this little zero degree um, line um, that I'm drawing my cursor through, Imagine that's the horizon um, where these little markers are. Um, so you'll see that you know Mercury being right there and Venus being right there, they're gonna be really close to the horizon, um, but you'll just be able to catch them like kind of late evening um, for like the first portion of the month. Um, like we're almost a little pushing it now, but if you were to go out tonight, you'd be able to catch them in the Northwestern sky. But after that, they'll be too difficult to catch. But for the first portion of the month, very low northwestern sky, you'll be able to catch Venus and Mercury um, hanging out low on the horizon or close to the horizon. Um, uh, in addition to that, Mars is going to be hanging out in the western sky in the late hours of the night for the last part of the month. Um, so previous to this, the sun will be illuminating too much of the sky. It'll be too hard to see. Um, but for the last part of the month, you'll be able to spot Mars um, in the uh, western sky, kind of west, um, southwest sky. Um, and uh, there will also be a conjunction between Mars and the moon on the night of June 13th. Um, this might be kind of difficult because the moon's gonna be shining pretty bright then. Um, well, not super bright because it'll be right after a new moon, I suppose, but the moon will be shining. Also the sun's light will be there. So it might be kind of difficult to pick Mars out just because there's gonna be so much other light in the sky. But I would, I would think you'd be able to catch it um, if you, you know, really focused on the area. So um, again, June 13th, um, late evening, um, Moon and Mars will have a conjunction in the western sky. Um, another thing that's happening this month is the June solstice, which happens every June. Um, the June solstice is um, simply the day where um, the Earth is tilted most towards the sun in its orbit, um, and that just means longer days for the northern hemisphere, pretty much. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's well, actually, you know what, maybe I won't ramble on. I did uh, pick out a little video that kind of explains um, solstices, um, so we can watch that. Um, is that coming through, Jessica? You know, can you see the preview? Okay, cool. Earth rotates on a tilted axis orbiting the sun, which means different parts of the planet are pointed at or away from the sun depending on the time of year. During the solstice on June 21, the North Pole is tilted toward the sun, allowing it to shine at a 90 degree angle on the Tropic of Cancer. Anyone standing right on the Tropic of Cancer at noon on solstice day will see the sun directly overhead and find themselves casting a very minimal shadow. Since the Northern Hemisphere faces the sun, it will experience the longest day and the start of summer. For the Southern Hemisphere, which tilts away from the sun, it is the shortest day and the start of winter. All right, so that's just kind of a quick little video explaining it. So um, again, for us in the Northern Hemisphere, longest day of the year, and then our kind of opposite to that is the um, winter solstice, um, which will be our shortest day of the year. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so this is the technical beginning of summer. Um, June 20th is. It's not the 21st, like the video said. It is uh, June 20th. Um, in addition to that, um, some more like news in um, astronomy and space flight. Um, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket will be making a couple deliveries to outer space this month, um, one of which is the uh, Dragon cargo craft, which um, will resupply the International Space Station with some supplies and science experiments, um, including some tardigrades and a couple other small animals or microbes, which is really exciting. We at the planetarium love tardigrades or water bears, as you might hear. Um, and they're doing an experiment with them at the ISS. So the um, Dragon Cargo Craft is going to be delivering that payload so that they can do those experiments. Um, it will also be delivering a satellite for Sirius XM, the radio company, um, to space to provide more coverage on Earth, which is kind of interesting, and a GPS satellite for the US Air Force so that our global positioning system can be uh, stronger or updated. Um, and then the other really interesting thing that's happening this month is um, on June 20th, NASA astronaut Shane Kimbrough, I believe I pronounced that right, and um, European Space Agency astronaut uh, Thomas Pesquet, or Pesquet, I believe is how it would be pronounced in French, um, will make a six and a half hour spacewalk um, to install new solar arrays on the outside of the International Space Station. Um, it's going to start at 7 a.m. Central Time, and you will be able to watch it on NASA's website. So if you're writing this down, um, June 20th, 7 a.m. our time um, on NASA's website, you'll be able to watch that spacewalk. Um, and it'll last about six and a half hours. So you'll be able to watch the whole thing, so you can join in whenever. And uh, that is all I have. So, so we did get a question. Sure. Um, let me turn my video on. Um, that asked, how often does the ISS get payloads? And I don't know if you know it, but I did just do a quick Google search. Yeah, I would make a guess, but just... Um, so what I have found in my quick Google search um, is they get uh, resupply or payloads ev about eight or nine times a year. So every about 40 to 45 days. Wow, that's more than I thought. That's a lot. Well, I think a lot of it will also depend on how many people are out there. Yeah. Right? More people, you need more supplies. Um, and this is saying that, like, it's not regularly spaced throughout the year. Right. Um, so the number of uh, resupplies does depend on, you know, the number of people that are out there. But, yeah, that's what I found about, about eight to nine times a year. Cool. And I'm sure the recent, you know, utilization of SpaceX and their rockets for NASA is also helping that like i'm sure it'll be more frequent because previous to that they were launched from russia right yep yeah so yeah um, i'm sure spacex helping out makes that more frequent too yeah it's always good to have some extra hands there yep awesome well some fun stuff going on this month and i just realized like it didn't occur to me that it is june which means we do have the summer solstice i don't know maybe we'll put together or something for the summer solstice. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. We did something for the winter solstice. So. Yeah, we did. I mean, it makes sense, right? Planetarium, astronomy. But we'll see. We'll see. I will. We will get back to you guys with any news on that. Um, yeah. So if there are any other questions, now's a great time to leave them down in the comments. Um, I'm not seeing any others at the moment. Um, other than you have a fan, Eli, who says that you should ramble on. Um, Who's that? When, when you were saying that you don't want to ramble on about, and you just have a video to show. Oh, about Never. the solstice? Yeah. Oh, sorry. They said that you should yeah. ramble. Oh, that you well, should thank go for you. it. <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. I'm pretty good at it. So catch another one. and. <laughs> I think we all get into that, those moments. Yeah, just that flow. Yeah. Um, all right, so let me tell you what's coming up over the next month. So on Saturday, we are doing our constellation show for June, where we'll take a look at the stars to constellations that are up this month, tips and tricks on how you can find those yourself, uh, and some of the stories behind them as well.
Uh, next week, uh, we got a really fun show for you next Wednesday. Uh, if you didn't know, Lindsay and Eli both do research, astronomical research at UMD. Uh, and so they are going to tell us about their research, which involves black holes, which is always a super fun topic. Um, so definitely come back here uh, next week to hear the two of them talk about their research and get a taste of what real astronomers do, what real research work is done in astronomy. I'm also just super proud of them and like them sharing what they do. Um, and then next uh, Saturday, we are going to look at uh, these group of objects that are called the Messier objects. Um, as we're heading into, you know, better weather, uh, we're able to kind of get out and enjoy the night sky without freezing ourselves. Um, and so we're going to take a look at some of these things called Messier objects, what they are, the different kinds of objects that they represent, uh, and then end with some ones that you can search for uh, this summer. Some of them you can see with your naked eye. Some of them you might need a small telescope or a small pair of binoculars, um, but lots of cool stuff there. Um, and if you didn't know, we have some awesome new uh, shirts available. You can find a link in the description. Uh, we've got lots of different, um, we have several different pattern designs now, as well as uh, size, fit, um, options, long sleeve, short sleeve, a couple different colors. Uh, we're really, really excited. So you can check that out. Uh, again, link is in the video description. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I think the only other thing to say is we are working very hard to get the planetarium back open. Um, we are hoping to start having some people in uh, this summer. We've got still waiting on some higher up approvals to, to finalize everything. But as soon as that's done, you will get that information. Um, and then we've also got a lot of fun updates happening this summer. So it's going to be great. It's going to be a great summer. We're very excited to, you know, be back in the planetarium space. But until we are back to full operations, we will continue to stream uh, on Wednesdays and Saturdays like we have been doing. That's not going anywhere until we're back uh, to our full normal in-person schedule. And even then, um, we may keep going a little bit. Um, there, we, we may still do some streams. Um, so, yeah. All right, well, I think we will wrap it up there. Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Enjoy the beautiful weather that at least we've been having here in Duluth. Uh, and we will see you again next time. Bye everyone.